All right. Um, almost eight o'clock. Let's uh, get started. Any any questions for me? I just confirmed with the guys at the PI that they have finished their officially their first term, so they are ready to get assignments. So I'm I'm ready to give out an assignment. The first assignment will be out sometime this week. It will be essentially a review of linear algebra. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to nonlinear systems. That's where I think you will see definitely new material. Um, and then hopefully end of this week, we can uh, put up a set of projects, about 20 projects, which you can look over over the next week or two and then select. And it'll be first come, first serve basis. Pick, uh, well, the first one to pick, I will just assign it to you and take the project off from the list. We'll try to keep it uh, dynamic. Okay. <coughs> so if there are uh, no questions, um, uh, let's uh, continue with uh, where we left off in the last lecture. Last lecture was essentially a review of uh, linear algebra. So we looked at the notations, the operations, addition, uh, multiplication, and even the inverse uh, as an equivalent of a generalization of a division operation with uh, arithmetic numbers. And then we went through the process of developing efficient algorithms for finding uh, inverse of a tr uh, triangular matrix, for example. So we will do this uh, as we go along keeping in mind always efficiency of the algorithm because we are preparing ourselves to be able to solve really large systems of uh, equations. 100,000, million, 10 million uh, equations is not really unreasonable these days. And uh, so we should be aware of all the pitfalls and problems of various algorithms. Um, so we're not going to spend in great detail and I'm not going to expect you to actually develop an algorithm or prove something about the algorithm. So the idea is for us to equip ourselves with enough computational tools so that we can efficiently solve real engineering problems. Okay? So that's why MATLAB, COMSOL, uh, ANSYS are all important tools. But we are going to scratch the surface a little bit to see when we read the manual, when they say use conjugate gradient method, what does it actually do? So you have a conceptual idea of <coughs> what it is and uh, when you can you hope to use it efficiently, things like that. Okay, so it's more like the first several lectures would be awareness building, and then we will go into some advanced algorithms, and then we will implement them on Comsol. Renal will help us do that. Okay, so this is where we stopped in the last class, and uh, these often we will find that the basic ideas we can learn by simply looking at a small simple problem. Okay, but the implication of this in a million by million system is going to be the same, okay? But you need to find an algorithmic way of handling the problem that we are going to see in this case. Now, what is the problem in this case? I have two equations in two unknowns, <coughs> epsilon x1 plus x2 equal to one, and x1 plus x2 equal to two, okay? But it turns out that I have fixed the number epsilon to be a small number. I still haven't overcome this problem, <laughs> okay? so. What happens, and epsilon is really uh, a small number. The same problem comes up in differential equations, and then we get into so-called singular perturbation method, where a parameter multiplies by a small number. We saw that in the fluid mechanics course last term, the Navier-Stokes equation, um, where we said viscosity is small, and so we drop that particular term. We get into trouble. Okay? So we put this in a matrix form, two by two uh, matrix form and epsilon is on the diagonal, okay? So if I apply uh, naive Gaussian elimination on this method, meaning I'm going to eliminate x1 from the second equation and uh, uh, solve for x2, okay? So I'm just stating what I'm doing here and it is not very difficult for you to actually go from um, uh, this step to this step. Go from this step to this step. Okay, I would encourage you to do that. Just don't listen to the lecture and then go away and come back and listen to the next lecture. You must spend some time 
filling in these uh, simple gaps. Okay? So in going from here to here, we are just eliminating uh, x1 and getting an equation in terms of x2. Straightforward Gaussian elimination type of idea. And when you do that, you get an expression for x2 that is 2 minus 1 over epsilon divided by 1 minus 1 over epsilon. We can actually analytically do this and ex explore the consequence of this. Now think about what would happen to this x2 as epsilon becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Initially think of it as 0 0.001 and then 0 0.00001, etc. What would happen to that ratio? There is no convergence yet. All I am asking is this is a number. The right hand side is a number. 2 minus 1 over a small number divided by 1 minus 1 over a small number. That's what we are going to get as a solution to x2. So we have actually taken these two equations by elimination, solved it, and obtained an expression in terms of the parameter epsilon. Now the question I'm asking you to think about is what would that number be as what would that number be when epsilon is very large? Two. Two. Uh, two. Not zero. Why two? If this number is very large, one over that number is going to be very small compared to two or compared to one. Okay. So if it is million, for example, then it will be two minus 0 0.00001, which will be 1.9999, something like that. Right. So this will approach to two. Uh, at the other limit, what would happen if epsilon goes to very small? You have to apply the same logic. Doesn't blow up. What you have is you will have a very large number here, 10 million, right? 10 million minus 2. Okay? So it's still going to be close to 10 million, right? And what about the denominator? 10 million minus 1. Still going to be close to 10 million. So what will be the ratio of these two numbers? One. one. Right? So it's not blowing up. There is no convergence issue or anything like that. The magnitude of that number, because we are doing these arithmetic operations on the computer between two numbers, and the problem that we get into is when we are dealing with adding or subtracting <coughs> a large number from a small number, you lose precision. This is the round off problem that comes. Now, if it can come in two by two problem, it can certainly come in a million by million problem more frequently. The more frequently encounter that problem, the more corrupted the solution is. Because I'm going to use x2 to calculate x1, right? The elimination process says first find x2 and then take x2, put it back in here, and solve for x1. Do you understand it? Any questions on that? Okay, so the magnitude of that solution depends on what that so, oops. so I have a table that I used uh, using the naive Gaussian elimination that we talked about last lecture. I just put epsilon equals 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 17. Okay. What does my algorithm do which doesn't use pivoting? That is the idea I want to drive at. So how do you control this problem? Okay. So mine simply uses naive elimination and you will get 1, 1, 2, 1, 0, and the answer will depend on what value of epsilon that I put in. Okay? Whereas MATLAB backslash operator will always give you the correct solution, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay? How does it do that? It uses pivoting. That means it says, okay, on the diagonal, I have a very small number. If I divide by a small number, I'm going to get into trouble. Okay? So I produce large numbers, and then I will do operations with large numbers. Um, so it will switch row 1 and row 2. Okay, and that is the basic idea of, of pivoting. And if you want to put pivoting into your program, that requires a lot of additional effort because you must have a logic that always checks what the current diagonal element is and wh which row you can switch that with and keep track of the switching. What happens whenever you switch two rows? Pardon me? The sign of the determinant will change, but you can keep track of that, right? But you need to keep track of, uh, when, you, when you do the back substitution, you need to keep track of the order in which you construct it. Because if you do LU decomposition in MATLAB, you will find the L is supposed to be a lower matrix and U is supposed to be upper triangular matrix. But it will produce something called a P matrix, a permutation matrix, okay? 
So you, you should understand what that is. That keeps track of whatever row changes that it has made. Okay? So the L that it gives you, actually when you print it out, will not have, these are all issues that I will ask you to kind of explore in your first assignment, will not have, apparently when you look at it, it will not have a lower triangular structure. But it is lower triangular, but because of the row operations, the things have been moved around. So P times L will be strictly lower triangular. So the basic idea I want to want you to get at from this problem is that when you have very small elements on the diagonal, just using naive Gaussian elimination can give rise to problems. So you need to use pivoting. You need to switch equations around like this that you see here. I still haven't mastered this. I don't, I've tried playing with this half an hour this morning. I came early, setting up various mouse and pointer controls, but still doesn't work. So when I switch this, to, to, yeah, question. I have a question about the table. Yeah. The, the um, small parameter epsilon. Why do you get, when you go from 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 17, uh, I'm confused at why it goes larger than smaller. <laughs> Good question. Um, it seems to be random, right? Okay. And so you need to understand why. Did you have a comment or a question? <coughs> it, it, it is random. You need to understand why it is random. Okay. So when I have something like this, I am taking the difference between two large numbers. Right. Okay. So the change, the difference between these two large numbers, if I make it to be in the 15th, 16th decimal place, and that's why I picked these numbers. Okay. okay. Then the round off is the one that is causing this. So the round off that will occur in the 15, 16 decimal place is random. Okay. So that's what is the cause, I think, of uh, this kind of a random behavior. But the main point is that the numbers are not trustable when you have when you don't use pivoting and we take differences between two large numbers or two small numbers. To understand this, you need to really understand how numbers are represented in the computer. Okay, so there are 64 bit positions, <coughs> and um, uh, I think 38 or something are used for the Mantisa part. And if you listen to 2160 lecture from my course on undergraduate, I have one lecture on number representation and okay. sources of errors. You'll learn more about it. Yeah. Again, that, that was part of my question was about how the number representative machines. But um, going off of what you said, I was random. Um, the question, I guess, for the benefit of those who are online, uh, is if I ran this, the question is why does it produce random numbers? And we saw that it is, um, or, I mean, we reasoned that it is because of uh, round off errors. Um, in the MATLAB, by default, uses about uh, 14, 15 decimal places, uh, double precision, 64 bits, if you want to be precise. Um, so if I run this program at different times, will I produce different result? Um, I really haven't done that, and my suspicion is that if you run it on the same architecture, you'll probably get the same result because the round algorithm is probably the same in all of them. But if you run it in different architectures, we may get different answers. Okay. But something that's uh, you have asked the question, you should probably go and explore it and see what happens. <laughs> run it on a Mac, and I mean they're all. It depends on what processes ultimately they use. And try, try it on different machines and see whether what you learn from that and maybe report to us next week. If I give that assignment, people will stop asking questions. <laughs> 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 right? Okay. So I just wanted you to want to do, introduce you to this Thomas algorithm, which is for tri-diagonal systems. Okay. So a tri-diagonal system, as we saw, is one that has elements on the diagonal, and one above the diagonal, and one below the diagonal. And we still have an equation of the form t x equal to b. Okay, but t is a tridiagonal matrix. So I'm augmenting that matrix just like I did with the Gaussian elimination. 
on the right hand side, V1, uh, V2, all the way to Vn. So it's essentially Gaussian elimination. But what we are doing here is uh, recognizing that a lot of these elements are already zero. So I don't have to, like, uh, all these are already zero. So I don't have to eliminate them. So I don't have to put, if I pass it to Gaussian elimination, it will still work. But it will be going to be eliminated, multiplying zero and subtracting, giving you zeros. Okay, so you can make the algorithm more efficient by simply recognizing that the loop has to go only from, for example, 2 to n. And only two elements have to be changed. One is the d, and the other one is the b, right hand side. Okay, because this is already eliminated, and there is nothing to be eliminated on the other terms. Okay. So Gauss, the Thomas algorithm is a simplified version of Gaussian elimination. Idea is exactly the same, but the algorithm involves fewer steps, and so it is much more efficient. And uh, I have a code, MATLAB code for these, and you will be using these things in the first assignment that I will construct. Okay. Now this is a concept that. Well, we have learned how Gaussian elimination works in its most efficient form. Okay, so by symbolic representation, I'm talking about how does the lower uh, when you do an LU factorization of A, how does L capture all the operations in the forward elimination, and how U contains all the information needed for back substitution. Okay, so I think I talked about this in the last lecture that you can factor a given matrix A uh, A as equal to L times U, product of two matrices. Okay. And uh, in fact, we have a 2n square unknowns here and n square equation. So you can use the extra degree of freedom to provide us some structure to L and U that we talked about. It. And these are the three different classifications that we have. The Doolittle method, which says the diagonal elements of L will be 1. And um, the Kraut method, which says the diagonal elements of U to be 1. And uh, the Cholesky factorization, which says that I don't know what the numbers are, but the diagonal element on the L and U will be the same. So you add an additional constraint. And uh, we can develop efficient algorithms for factorization. Um, by simply looking at the logic of how to construct each one of the unknowns, introducing only one unknown at a time. But before we go and do that, I wanted to point out uh, the relationship between Gaussian elimination and LU factorization. So I'm given A and B. I have AX equal to B, so I'm given the matrix A and the right hand side B. If I take that matrix A, and three multiplied by a matrix called L1. But L1 is structured in particular way. Okay, So L1 has oops, L1 has the structure that you see here. This is not going to let me do struggling more today. There it is. Okay. So L1 is structured in such a way that, uh, is this L2 already? L2. <laughs> okay, L1 is structured in such a way that I can construct this by a simple row. The first element is 1 over A11. That is essentially every element is divided in the first column by A11. And the, uh, from row 2 to N, I put a minus sign. That's my L11. So it is strictly a lower triangular, one on the diagonal, and a specific rule to construct the first column. Now, if I carry out the multiplication of these two, that is equivalent in the Gaussian elimination language, uh, eliminating x1 from all the equations, second equation to n equation. That will produce 0. You need, you need to convince yourself of that. For example, 1 over a11 multiplied by a11, which is 1. And everything else is 0. Okay, so that gives you the 1. Then you take the second row with the first column. Okay, that's going to give you this number that you see here. 
So the second row minus A21 over A11 multiplied by A11. So A11 cancels out, we get minus A21 plus A21, 1 times A21, right? And that will be equal to 0, that cancels out. So if you carry out this multiplication once with that matrix L1, it is equivalent to eliminating X1. Do you understand that? Okay. Now, you can get the idea. So I'm going to now define uh, that matrix as U1. Okay. L1 times A is equal to U1. L1 times A is equal to U1. And U1 is not yet a fully upper triangular matrix, but it has the first column from which X1 has been eliminated. <coughs> and I repeat that process. with a second matrix L2, which is also strictly lower triangular, but this time I'm dealing with the second column. L2 means I'm dealing with the second column. I do exactly the same operation, 1 over A2, 2, superscript 1. Why, what do I mean by the superscript? I mean that it has that number has been changed from the original number once in the previous operation. Okay? So now you carry out this multiplication, you will get a U2 matrix, which will have 1 and 0 below that. Uh, diagonal element in the second column. So this series of operations, when you continue, okay, L1 times A1 equals U1, L2 times uh, U1 equals U2, L2, L3 times U2 equals <coughs> U3, etc. And then combine all of them together, what you will find is that uh, LN minus 1, L minus 2, all the way to L1, multiplied by A is equal to UN minus 1. <coughs> But the product of all these lower triangular matrix will still be lower triangular. Okay? So you have a lower triangular matrix multiplied by A is equal to, at that stage you will get a strictly upper triangular matrix. So all the operations that are needed for forward elimination are actually contained in this. And this could be considered as an algorithm, a rule which you could implement. But will you implement that? Why? It's not efficient. It's very inefficient, right? You need to, when you have millions by millions of matrix multiplication itself, becomes a very challenging task. So you need to have uh, n minus 1 uh, matrices that are to be multiplied um, in sequence. Okay? So it's not a very efficient way of doing it, but it does allow you to view the process of Gaussian elimination as L times A is equal to A. I mean, equal to u, so a is equal to l inverse u, which is equal to, I called it as l tilde u. The tilde came out a little below. Okay, but that is the product of two triangular matrices, lower triangular and upper triangular matrix. And that's why we say that all the information that is needed for forward elimination is contained in that lower uh, triangular matrix. So that gives us the drive. We can certainly implement the naive Gaussian elimination that we saw earlier, which is efficient. Okay? Uh, we can put uh, pivoting on top of that, and we have an efficient scheme. But the only problem with that is if the matrix A, the operator A, is the same, but my right-hand side B keeps changing, I need to go back and refigure out all the operations one more time. Okay? So if I have a situation where my model is constant, the model is captured, in that matrix A, and the forcing term, the right-hand side, keeps changing, I want to be able to develop a method where I figure out L and U once and for all. And so I don't have to do an inverse or Gaussian elimination. All I have to do is two matrix multiplications, and I get the answer. Okay? So that's the reason, the motivation for developing this LU decomposition. Okay? So what is the efficient way of getting the LU decomposition? Obviously, one that we just saw is a way that will get you those matrices L and U. Because we know how to construct L1, L2 all the way to N minus 1. We just take the product, and it gives you L. And we, we already saw in the last lecture how to invert a lower triangular matrix very efficiently. Okay? So now we are saying, well, I'm not, I don't want to invert it. I just want to find the products of um, the L and U. So <coughs> whenever you do this, you need to look at in detail. Okay. What is the most efficient way of getting all the unknowns? So I have two matrices L and U, and all the elements in L are unknown. All the upper part of the elements U are unknown. I've just picked the diagonal element of U to be equal to 1. But what is given is the right-hand side. Okay. So how many unknowns are there? Okay. 
you actually need to figure out a formula because you'll have n unknown and then n minus 1 unknown all the way to 1. So what is the sum of 1, 2, 3 all the way to n? Uh, n into n plus 1 over 2, right? You remember the formula? Yeah. So that will be 1 and then you need to do the same thing for 1 all the way to n minus 1. And when you do that, you should get n squared when you add these up. Why? Because we have n squared equations. <coughs> Okay, it's an n by n matrix, so there are n square elements, and so that the, when you equate the left, every element of the left hand side equal to the element of the right hand side after taking the product on the left side, you will get n square equations. So in n square unknowns, but the, to make it efficient, we cannot assemble all the equations and say solve again, because we are not helping ourselves. We, we have increased the problem. So what we need to do is figure out a way in which we introduce only one unknown at a time, and that strategy lies in recognizing that if you find all the elements of one column in L, okay, then go to the U matrix, find all the rows, and then come back and find the next column, and go back the next row. So if you alternate like that between, you will find that every time you introduce only one unknown at a time. I'm just going to show you the final equations. So for example, I'm, I'm finding all the columns of this, okay? So it is L11 times 1, everything else is 0, is equal to A11. So L11 is equal to A11, okay? And go to L21. L21 times 1 plus L22 times 0, everything else is 0. So I have only L21 as the unknown. So L21 is equal to what? A21, right? So if you go down that particular column, you'll find L I1 is equal to A I1. That's what this equation captures. Okay, so you need a loop to put that around, and it works for 100, 100,000 equations. L I1 equals A I1. So you found out one column of that uh, lower triangular matrix L. Now, if you go to the next one, you'll be in trouble because when you write the equation for L22, you will introduce more than one unknown. Okay? Uh, how is that? You can very easily verify that. Suppose I take this. Okay, so L21 times U12 plus L22 equals A22. But I have L22 as an unknown and I have U12 as the unknown. Okay, so don't go for the next column, but go for the first row of U. Okay, and when you do that, you will find once again that, uh, uh, for example, I'm interested in finding U12. So I need to take the first row with the second column. So L11 times U12 because everything else is zero, is equal to A12, okay? So in that one, I already found out what L11 is in the previous step. So sequencing is important, right? So I already found out what L11 is. So U12 is equal to A12 over L11. And we do the same thing for every element on, on the side, okay? And that's what this equation is, okay? So now we need to do the second column, and then the second row, and the third column, third row, etc. Let's continue on. Any questions? Okay. So we alternate. Between the rows of L and columns of U. Okay. And you will get these two equations and you put them, you need, the, the challenge here would be for you to make sure that you understand how do you find the ranges, okay, for j going to 2 to n, i going from j to n. So j going to 2 to n, all we are saying is that formula applies for uh, every one of these columns, okay, but i going from j to n. That means from the diagonal all the way to the bottom. Okay, so the inner starting index is starting from the diagonal for each one. Okay. <coughs> so these are fairly simple floating point operations, and that's why there is only one unknown element in every one of them. But you do have a division by Ljj. So none of the diagonal elements on L can be zero or very small. If it is very small, then you need to do pivoting. And that's what the MATLAB LED composition uh, scheme will do. Okay. 
here is the MATLAB implementation of that. So look at that, make sure that you um, understand. I find having a piece of code which actually nails down the implementation helps me understand and internalize uh, basic ideas. Okay, so given a matrix AX equal to B, now I know that I can factor that, okay? <laughs> Here it is. I can factor A as LU times X and, <laughs> okay, and so, U x is equal to L inverse B. I know how to efficiently invert a lower triangular matrix. Okay? And uh, if A doesn't change, then I can invert this only once and save that. Of course, it's a competition between storage and the computation okay, of uh, how you can invert that. And that product is going to be what I call V prime, another vector. So x is equal to U inverse V prime. Okay? So that ultimately turns out to be the most efficient way of direct solver. So this is called a direct solver because you can get the solution vector x through a finite number of predictable number of operations. Okay? The disadvantage with the direct method is any error that you introduce, the round off error, is stuck. You cannot get rid of it. It's going to be propagating, it's going to be enhancing the uh, errors in the solution. So if you have a very large system, then the uh, solution is prone to round off error problems. So that's what leads us to the next concept, which is iterative algorithms. Okay? There are two reasons why we need iterative algorithms. And uh, one is to take some control over the round off error. The other one is the computation itself. Okay? Iterative methods turn out to be much more efficient in terms of the number of floating point operations that you need for very large systems. As the number of uh, uh, equations increases, the operations remain reasonably <coughs> bounded for the iterative systems. For a direct system, it goes something like n cubed. This, this you can make it go as n squared or n log n or something like that. Okay. How many of you are familiar with what, what I mean by iterative methods? What, what are the main features of an iterative method? Do you want to just give some idea? Of you try to find an approximation to the matrix that's well structured as a starting point. So uh, if you could start with you know, maybe all the diagonal elements, for example, or you could start with the other triangle, just take the portions of it. Mm -hmm. and then you basically solve that to get an approximation and then keep up the that, 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 that is the key. The key is you start with an approximation for your solution vector. Okay. And using that approximation, <coughs> the approx obviously you're going to make a guess for your solution vector. And you call that as your approximate solution. It's not going to satisfy the equation. So the equation that we have is simply uh, Ax equal to B. Okay. So I know A, I know B, but I don't know what X is. So I'm saying I'm going to make a guess for all the numbers in the vector x. And when I put it in there, and then I calculate ax minus b, and I call that as the residual r, what do I want the r vector to be? Zero. But it's not going to be zero because this is a arbitrary guess that I made. So in iterative method, the key is to find an algorithm that will give you a better guess than what you made. Okay? So you need to have a that will give you successively better and better guesses. Okay? And you can repeat that as many times as you need and monitor this residual. If that residual goes down to a certain predefined value, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 14, whatever it is. You say, okay, my guess is good enough for me. I'll stop there. Okay? So you need to come up with a guess, come up with an algorithm that will successively improve that guess, and come up with a scheme for deciding when you have reached your solution vector. Okay? And there is something called a fixed point iteration. Have you heard of what that is? If you have not, I think it is important 
that we talk about it. Again, we will take a very simple example and go through the idea of what a fixed point iteration is. Learn from that this idea of convergence. Okay? Because what we are doing is we are repeating that algorithm and we want to know that the next guess that you are going to make is better than the previous guess. If that happens, you have a convergence sequence. You are going to go towards the solution. But if the next guess turns out to be worse than the previous guess, we are going to be diverging. We are going to be blowing up. So there are algorithms that are implemented in Aspen, in ANSYS, in COMSOL. These iterative methods, particularly for large systems, may or may not work sometimes. Okay, when it blows up, you need to know why does it blow up. Okay, and we will talk about many reasons, but this is the first reason that we are seeing. The a method that you have constructed for updating your initial guess need not be the best method that uh, uh, you can come up with. Okay, so. So given an equation AX equal to B, our task is to reformulate that equation in the form XP plus 1 equals G of XP. Okay, G is some mapping. So this is the guess vector I'm going to put in there. Okay, I need to construct what G is. For linear system, G could be just a matrix. Okay, <coughs> So then it is just a vector matrix product that will give you a new one. Okay, take that and put it back and repeat that. And when I put back a vector, and I get back the same vector, what does that mean? You are converged. And that's why it's get the idea, uh, the name fixed point iteration. Okay? So it is a fixed point in your state space, and your convergent process is, goes towards the fixed point. Now that fixed point may be an attractor. If it is an attractor, then no matter where your guesses are, it will be attracted to that point. Or it may be a repeller, meaning it is an unstable uh, fixed point, so no matter how close you start from, you'll always go back, go away from that. And I have a very simple example to illustrate for a quadratic equation, a single equation, but a nonlinear equation uh, in a single unknown, and then we'll come back and develop these methods of Jacobi iteration, successive over relaxation uh, scheme for system of linear equations. But that is the basic idea. The basic idea is from the given problem, construct an iterative process. That means you find out what G is. And you can construct this in <coughs> any different way. But some of them will be convergent, some of them will not be convergent. So the idea of numerical analyst is to develop the best method over a period of time by testing it, by developing theories on uh, when they will converge, to understand when they will converge. Any questions on that? So here is the basic idea behind fixed point iteration. So suppose I'm given an equation f of x equal to 0. Now we're going back to a single scalar equation to explore the idea. Just like for pivoting, we took two equations, simple, uh, so we can track the math, but, uh, get, get at the concept. So I can always, I claim that I can rearrange this and form x equal to g of x. In the matrix, it will be x will be a vector, g will be a matrix perhaps. But if it is a function, then x is a, a vector still, but G is a function that maps X into X itself. And that's why it's called a fixed point iteration. Okay. So I don't know why I get so many blank pages. Ah. Okay, here is an example f of x equals x squared minus x minus six equal to zero. Scalar equation, a single nonlinear algebraic equation. Okay. What are the roots for that? It's a quadratic equation. You can solve it, and you'll find the root is at one is at minus two, the other one is at three. Okay. So these two values will satisfy the particular equation. Suppose I don't know that. So I'm just, as I said, I'm taking a simple example, but always keep in your mind this equation function could be a complicated nonlinear function that we don't know how to solve. Okay. And so we don't even know how many roots there are. And these are the problems that we will learn how to solve later on. But the claim that I made is that I can always rearrange that problem f of x equal to 0 as x equals g of x. Okay? And here I'm showing you one way. I'm going to show you at least three different ways of doing that. Okay? In one way, what I'm doing is I'm keeping the x square on the left hand side, move x plus 6 to the right hand side, and take the square root. Okay? So x equal to square root of x plus 6. So I'm going to call g of x as square root of x plus 6. Okay? Then I'm going to put a number for x 
calculate g of x and set that equal to x and repeat that process. So graphically, what does this mean? It simply means uh, if I plot the left hand side and the right hand side, again, I'm going to try to draw this. Uh, always, uh, okay, so I have x is equal to square root of x plus 6, which is what I call g of x. Okay, so this is the right hand side. And this is the left hand side. I want the left hand side to be equal to right hand side. The left hand side, I can graphically draw this, right? Y equal to x. On the right hand side, uh, square root of x plus 6, so that graph may look something like this. So if I plot the left hand side, I get a straight line. And the right hand side, I get a curve. So where is the solution? What is the solution I'm looking for? It's the intersection of these two curves, where the left hand side is equal to right hand side. So if I make a guess, a wild guess, I don't know where it is. <coughs> okay, so I take that wild guess and put it in here and find out what is the y, y axis, what is x plus square root of x plus 6. In the graph, all I need to do is read that number from there. Right? And I'm going to now say that is equal to x. So I'm going to go towards that. And then I read the next one and go towards that. So here the graph is such that actually converges in a few iterations. Okay? But the key that you need to notice is that at the point where these two intersect, what is the slope of that curve g of x? What is g prime? Less than 1, because this has a slope of 1, y equal to x. Right? So this has a slope of less than 1. Okay? Turns out that is a key condition for convergence. Okay? A fixed point iteration will converge if g prime of x, its absolute magnitude is less than 1. The next question ask, to ask is, how does this translate into matrices when we have? Okay? So we will see that a very similar condition exists, that the matrix g that we construct must have spectral radius as less than 1. What it means is the largest <coughs> eigenvalue in that matrix must be less than 1. Then that iterative sequence will and once you figure that out, then you can say, okay, I can construct G in different ways, and which way converges, uh, and which way doesn't converge. Question, yeah? Is that to say, I mean, I'm trying to think of this graphically. If you had a cubic function where the right-hand side kind of went up yeah, to yeah. the left of the left-hand side, your iterations would just diverge. Exactly, exactly. I have actually a case that shows all the three different ways of rewriting that equation. This is one where you write it as square root of x plus 6. Now, if you go back. You can obviously think of other ways of writing. For example, you can keep x one side and move x square. Um, x is equal to x square minus 6. Right? That is, move this x to one side and then keep the x square minus 6. Okay? Or you can uh, factor the x times x minus 1 and move that. There are many ways of writing that equation in a form where you separate x and move all the other things to the right hand side and call that as your g of x. So I have three ways that I have shown here, and I just want to introduce the basic idea. So this is for that particular iteration. Starting at 5, you write a small MATLAB file to generate the successive iterates, and you will find that it converges to 3 uh, in about 10 iterations. Then I, I, you may want to go through this in detail. What the question would be then? What happens if I, instead of picking x zero equal to five, I pick x zero equal to some other number? Okay. So in that particular problem, there are two roots. One is at three. The other one is at minus two. Okay. So if um, and it turns out that g prime at three is minus three over two. Okay. And g prime at minus two is minus two over three. This is for I think the. Next uh, option, let me go back. Yeah, the other way of writing is x equals g of x, which is 6 divided by x minus 1. If you take this g and take its g prime and evaluate the g prime at uh, 3 and minus 2, you will find 
that one of them is less than 1, the other one is greater than 1, minus 1.5. We care only about the absolute magnitude. Okay? If there is a minus sign, what does it mean? It simply means that the approach to that root is going to be cyclical around it instead of being monotonic. Okay? But in here, it's going to converge because it is minus 2 over 3 less than 1. Okay? And a third formulation is, as I said, x equals x squared minus 6. So in these three cases, I just constructed a simple MATLAB file to see how I can plot these things. Okay? So this is the first case, and the slope is less than 1. And if you start from anywhere here, it will converge to that. If you start from the right also, it will converge to that. Okay? Now, the second case, the g of x turns out to be something like this. And y equal to x is that line. Okay? So even if you start with a root that is very close to that, okay, this is the root where the intersection of y equal to x and g of x, even if you start from there, you'll find that the slope is greater than 1. Okay? So it just goes around it, switches to the other side, and here the slope is less than 1. So it is attracted to that. So when you have multiple uh, fixed points like this, which one will be attracted to depends on the, which one is a stable iterative scheme and where your initial condition is. Okay? Now, all these have a very similar parallel to dynamical systems that we will see later on. But these are all for iterative sequence. A numerical iterative sequence to get at the solution can have very complicated behavior. But we can understand it in terms of a very simple rule. That is, g prime must be less than 1. If at a root, that, but the, it's, is it a useful rule to say g prime at the root must be less than 1? It's really not a useful rule because we don't know where the root is, right? When you're given a problem, if you know the root, then it says, okay, that, is that root uh, <coughs> convergent or not? Okay, so if you give me a problem for which I don't know where the roots are, and I make a guess, and it converges. So every root which is an attractor for which the slope is less than 1, I will be able to find it. But every root for which it is not, I won't even know its existence because I won't be able to go near that. Right? So those are challenges in uh, uh, solving uh, nonlinear problems. Okay? So here is another, the third example. Once again, the slope turns out to be greater than 1. So even if you start very close to it, it will just diverge. It will blow up. So in a few iterations, you will get into the 300 as your uh, iterative sequence. Okay, so a fixed point iteration scheme is then a scheme in which you construct a mapping of x equals g of x and start with some initial guess. So that is your algorithm. x equal to g of x is the algorithm for improving, but it doesn't always work. Okay? And uh, geometrically, we saw what needs to happen. The slope has to be less than 1. Now, can we understand that from an analytical <coughs> procedure? So this is the error analysis for that particular problem. Uh, it's a fairly simple thing to understand. I have a constructed an iterative sequence x sub i plus 1 equals g of x sub i. And I know when it converges, the root is uh, r equals x sub r. r equals x sub r. Okay? Meaning when I put the root, I will get the same value. At convergence, this is satisfied. At any other point, it will give you a new value, hopefully a better value. Now, I'm going to subtract one from the other. So xi plus 1 minus r on the left hand side is equal to g of xi minus g of r. Okay? Now, I can interpret this difference on the left hand side as the error in step i plus 1 because it's a difference between the root and the current iterator. Okay? So that is the error at the i plus 1. On the right hand side, I'm going to multiply and divide by xi minus r, just a mathematical manipulation. Okay. And then I can interpret this as the error at the height step. Okay. But what is the interpretation I can give for this? G of xi minus g of r divided by xi minus r. That is the slope of a chord connecting xi and r. Okay. So, and from mean value theorem, we can say that slope is the same as the slope to the actual function. Remember, these two are points, two points. One is r, the other one is xi. I'm connecting that two points, and I get the slope of the card. And I think I have probably a picture of it. 
illustrating what the mean value theorem is. So here is your curve, and I have xi as a point and r as a point on that curve. Okay. So g of xi minus g of r divided by xi minus r is the slope of that curve that I have illustrated there. Okay. But the mean value theorem says if the function is continuous, I can always find a tangent to the curve that is parallel to this. That means it has the same slope. The only thing I won't know is where that tangent occurs, the psi, where exactly it occurs. Okay. But so I can replace, I can replace that slope of the curve by the slope of the function evaluated at some point psi in that range. Okay. And that's how we come up with this criterion. that that is replaced by g prime and if the error at i plus 1 step must be smaller than the error at the i step g prime must be less than 1 okay so that guarantees convergence but the psi is some some value in the neighborhood of r we don't know where that is but we can always find such a place if you are given the function okay any questions on that so it introduces you to some of the basic ideas of what, uh, how error analysis is done and how you learn when a particular sequence will converge or not converge. Okay? Any questions? Let me just jump to those guys and ask. How are you guys doing? Any questions? I'm talking to people at the PI. <coughs> Brunal is also there. Hi, Brunal. Welcome. Are you able to hear us? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm just checking whether you guys are alert or not. <laughs> Good. Good. So, any questions from people at uh, PI? Yeah. 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 We should enable the audio two ways. Uh, that's going to be a bit uh, challenging, I think. I don't see speakers in this room. OK, so let's continue then. So any questions here? So that's the fixed point iteration illustrated for a single equation. Now let's go and develop some efficient algorithms for solving a large system of linear equations. So how many of you have not uh, seen Jacobi iteration, successive over relaxation? If you have not seen, so all of you have seen that, one, only one. Pardon me? You are not sure what it is. OK. All right, so let's just go through the basic idea behind it. and. Uh, Again, I think I probably have a piece of code that will uh, show you how to implement it. But the fixed point iteration for a system of linear equations can always be written as some matrix T times x P plus C. Okay? So this is given A x equal to B. From A, I need to construct this matrix T and this vector C, and then make a guess, put x in here, and calculate the new x P plus 1 according to the right hand side of this equation and repeat that process. Okay? And as I said earlier, the right hand side becomes g. Now g prime must be less than 1. So what would have c is a constant. right? So what would g prime be? Did you have a question? No. What would g prime be in this case? g prime would simply be t. Right? Because it's a linear equation, so we're taking the derivative of that with respect to x. right? So g prime would simply be t, and so we want something about that matrix T, which is a constant matrix, to be bounded so that it produces errors that are less and less every iteration. And that turns out to be what they call the spectral radius that is the largest eigenvalue. And we will see eigenvalue problem in the next lecture, and you will uh, develop a better appreciation for why that link is, why the eigenvalue of, uh, we, we want a single measure. Okay, G prime for a scalar problem is easy, but for this case, it turns out to be there. <coughs> so again, the same idea. xp plus 1 equals t, xp plus c, and r equals t, r plus c. r meaning converge rule. When you put r, you're going to get r. And you can find the difference between those, and that is your error. 
and you want that error is related by, that's why the constant drops out when you subtract. Okay? So error at p plus 1 is equal to t times the error at p. So t must be bounded. Okay? That's what we need to uh, we understand from that. So I'm going to show you a few way, ways of constructing that matrix t. The first one is called the Jacobi iteration. Let me illustrate the idea <coughs> first before we go into the equation. Okay. So you have uh, Ax equal to B. Okay. So we said that we're going to make a guess for the vector X, all the numbers in uh, the vector X. And what I want to do is from each, there are n equations when I expand this out. From each equation, I'm going to extract one component of the vector n as an unknown, keep it on the left side, move everything else to the right hand side. That's what we saw in the scalar problem, f of x equal to 0, you separate one x and push everything else to the right hand side and that's your g of x. So in the Jacobi iteration, we are going to keep from every equation uh, one variable. For example, this is the first equation. So I'm going to keep x1 from there and move all the other things, x2, x all the way to xn to the right hand side and divide by a11 because I've kept x1. a11 times x1 equals b1 minus a12 x2 minus a13 x3 x2. But I'm making a guess for this vector x, right? <coughs> so I'm going to put that guess value in here for all the x's on the right hand side. And that's going to give me a new guess, a better guess hopefully for x1 p plus 1. So from the second equation, I will keep x2 and move everything else to the other side. So <coughs> from every one of those equations, I will keep that variable on the left hand side and move everything else to the right hand side. <coughs> so if I have the j variable from the j equation, so all the way from 1 to j minus 1, 1 to j minus 1 will go to the right hand side. And similarly from j plus 1 to n, We'll also go to the right hand side. But they will all be evaluated based on the guess that I make. Okay? In fact, to write the program for the Jacobi iteration, all I need is the second line. And a loop around that going from J going from 1 to M. Okay? But I need to keep two vectors. An old vector that you make a guess, that is a peak level, and a new vector that you are updating at the people's first level. Okay, please follow this carefully. Okay, so I need to keep two vectors. One is the guess, the other one is the updated value. Once I update completely, I can take the new one and put it into the old and put another loop. Okay, second loop around that. And in that loop, at the end of the loop, I need to check whether things have converged or not. Okay? <coughs> so that is the most efficient way of implementing it. Two loops. An inner loop which searches all the which handles all the component one by one, and an outer loop which handles iteration by iteration and then a check to make sure that the things have converged or not. But how do we represent it symbolically, mathematically, in terms of the lower, the upper, and the uh, diagonal matrices? And that is given in here. The operations involved in that splitting, that is, you can take A, and you can write that A as equal to, this has nothing to do with LU factorization, okay? You can write that as equal to L plus D, plus u. What would L contain? The lower parts of matrix A. The B will contain the diagonal part of the matrix A, and U will contain the upper part of the matrix A. It's not an LU factorization, just a sum of these three. But whenever I have the lower part, and I'm going to multiply this by <coughs> x, A x, and then set it equal to B. Okay? So I will have L x plus D x plus U x equal to B. Okay? And I'm going to evaluate only the one that multiplies by D, that is the current variable number at xp plus 1. All the others will be done at the old value. That's what I've indicated by index notation in the earlier equation and by the symbolic uh, Gibbs notation in the equation at the bottom of this page. Okay? So do you understand how this comes from? Any questions on that? <coughs> Why would I write it like this? This is not an efficient way of doing it because we have 
three vector matrix multiplications, and those are expensive operations, right? <coughs> so what I want to do is I want to construct that matrix T x plus R uh, plus C, okay? So that I know which matrix I am using as an iterative matrix, and whether its eigenvalues are less than one. That's going to be probably part of your uh, first assignment, or uh, some problem that I'll give you. I'll ask you to construct that matrix and check whether its eigenvalues are less than one, whether it's going to be convergent or not. Okay, so from here it's fairly easy. Keep D to the left hand side, move everything else to the right hand side, separate them out, and what you will find is oops. Okay, here I've indicated what D and L and U are. They are strictly the lower, the upper part of the A matrix. It's not an early factorization. And then XP plus one is equal to D inverse. B minus L plus U XP, simply rearranging, moving the L and U to the right hand side. Now D inverse is what? We already know it's a diagonal matrix, it's 1 over A1, 1, 1, 1 over A2, 2, etc. Fairly easy to construct. And here we have two additions and then a vector matrix multiplication. Okay? So you separate this out. So G of XP is this entire right hand side, but you separate this out with the ones that multiply by xp and the ones that are constant. Okay. So, <coughs> so you will find d inverse l plus u xp. So that's going to be your t matrix. t <coughs> matrix is going to be d inverse times l plus u. And then the constant will be d inverse b. Okay. So it is this, the characteristic of this matrix minus D inverse L plus U that's going to determine whether your iterative scheme will be convergent or not. And people have proven that as long as this A is diagonally dominant, okay, what does that mean? That all the diagonal elements are much bigger in va numerical value than the off-diagonal elements. And there's a strict definition of what a diagonal dominance means, but you can see if D are all very large, one over D will be small. So that's a well well behaved matrix. And as long as that happens, the spectral radius of that will be less than one and the Jacobi iteration is actually convergent. Okay. Now can you come up with a way of improving on the Jacobi iteration? gauss -Seidel. It's a very simple change to the concept, and that is, <coughs> if you give me a guess, why should I keep that guess until I update all the numbers, which is what we did in the Jacobi iteration? Because when I'm calculating x2, I already have a new value for x1. Why can't I use that? Okay, <coughs> And that is the idea behind gauss idle iteration. So as soon as a new value is available, in, in these components, use them. What does that mean? How does that translate into the equation? So if you take uh, xjp plus 1, <coughs> it's extremely sensitive for you and good narratives. Switches. Okay, so bj minus ajkt uh, xkp plus 1. So this number is immediately updated. As soon as the value is updated, I'm using it on the next step. So all the values that are from j plus 1, that is to the right hand side of that, are, must be necessarily evaluated at the old guess, because I don't have a new guess for them yet. Okay? So that is the only change. As soon as you have a new value available in your iterative scheme, use that in that uh, iteration. So once again, all you need is that one loop. And uh, this is even better, both in terms of convergence and in terms of storage. Why is it better in terms of storage? You just keep one vector. Okay, as soon as you put a new value, it automatically uses that new value. Okay, So you, you don't need to make these two vectors old and the new vector. Just keep one vector for x, make a guess, and calculate a new value, and that will automatically be used in there. Okay? So what you need to do is now be able to construct the T matrix from this so that you can calculate its eigenvalues. And that would simply mean what? Let me see whether you can guess. So th this part goes with <coughs> T 
the, we, we wrote the matrix A as L plus D plus U, okay? So the L part goes with what? The known values, the updated values, or the old values? updated values, right? So you'll have L going with XP plus 1, and you also have XP plus 1 here. So we need to combine these two, okay? <coughs> so here you have L times XP plus 1 plus D times XP plus 1 plus U times XP equal to B, okay? Now you need to combine this L and D. So the inverse will be L plus D inverse times B minus U X P. And you can again separate the constants and the T matrix G prime to simply minus L plus D inverse U. So you construct that matrix and then calculate the eigenvalues. So as a learning experience, it may be worth doing it in your assignment, but you will never do that. The way that you would actually implement this would be the index notation equation that I showed you with a loop, okay? Because you don't want to separate the matrix and have three mid large matrices. You need storage for L and U. Okay. Any questions? Now, these are two different ways of rearranging that matrix. Just like in the scalar problem, we saw there are many ways of rearranging it. I've shown you two different ways of rearranging that matrix. Now, the next question is, can I get some extra degree of freedom to accelerate the rate of convergence? And that is the uh, so-called successive over relaxation scheme. <coughs> so here is the piece of code for gauss seidel iteration where you input the matrix A, the vector B, an initial guess X, and some sort of a tolerance to decide when it has converged. Okay? You might put a number like 10 to the minus 7. Then what you will do is you will take the norm, you will take the norm of AX minus B, which is your residual. And if that norm is less than 10 to the minus 7, or whatever the tolerance that you specify, <coughs> you will terminate the iteration. And the max is there to safeguard in case it doesn't converge and you don't want to get into an infinite loop. Okay? So try a maximum number of iterations, 20 iterations, 100 iterations, and then give up. <coughs> okay? So you should study these uh, pieces of MATLAB code to understand that you have uh, a grasp of how to implement uh, these ideas. Now, successive over relaxation is an improvement over gauss seidel iteration. And the basic idea is this. Whatever value that I get, what I got from gauss seidel as the improved value, using the updated value as soon as possible, and the old values where I have to use the old values, I get a value. This is not going to be my final iterate at that time. So I'm going to call this as a temporary variable. And I'm going to speed up that convergence by using uh, something called a relaxation factor. Okay, so that is the, my true xj at p plus 1. The true estimate of the next best guess would be the old guess plus a factor that I'm going to introduce called omega, which is called the relaxation factor. So if it is greater than 1, you will call it as over relaxation, less than 1, under relaxation. If it is equal to 1, it becomes exactly the same as gauss seidel method. Why? You can see that if you put it 1, xp, xp will cancel out. The new value, tentative value that we have calculated is your final value, okay? So you get an extra degree of freedom to tune this parameter omega. Okay, and particularly for nonlinear systems when you are extending this idea, it becomes extremely useful to manipulate convergence, manage convergence. You may initially use under relaxation, and as you go closer to the root, you may <coughs> try to use the over relaxation to speed up the convergence. But when you do this, these two equations combine and put them in the vector matrix form. Here I have not shown the steps, but I want you to um, kind of be able to do it even in the final exam. Remember, the final exam is an oral exam. I say, go and show me this, okay? I'm just trying to keep you active after the class, not just listen to the lecture and then forget about it. Okay, so xp plus 1 equals xp plus omega times uh, that particular expression. Okay, all you need to do is substitute for t into here and then write it in terms of the matrices L, D, and U, and separate the XP plus 1 from the XP. Okay. And when you separate it, you will get finally get this equation. Okay, and the T now becomes a function of omega. So the spectral radius can be tuned by tuning omega. 
And there is a theoretical analysis done by Young in 1971. And he showed that for linear system, diagonally dominant uh, matrix A, that the successive um, over relaxation scheme works, converges as long as omega is less than 2. Omega has to be in this range between 0 and 2. Omega is greater than 2, this scheme will always go on, will always diverge. Okay? So that's a very strong theoretical result that uh, you should be aware of, so that you never put a value of omega greater than 2 because this is the proof is only for linear systems. Only for linear systems you can do these things. When you go for nonlinear systems, all these goes out the window. Okay, but if it doesn't work for even for linear system, what are the chances that it's going to work for nonlinear system? So we use that experience and uh, never go uh, beyond uh, omega equal to two. The, and somebody else came up and said, okay, what is the best value that accelerates the convergence of the fastest range? And it turns out to be for linear systems, somewhere in the range of 1.7, 1.8 to get the best uh, rate of convergence. How do we define rate of convergence? Just throw these words, but we need to get an idea of meaning behind them. That's an error divided by the number of iterations. The error divided by the number of iterations. How fast does the error decrease? So if you plot error versus iteration number, the slope of that will be your rate of convergence. Is that all we have? I'm done. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, we still have some time. Um, <coughs> let me just. <coughs> okay. So, what is coming next? What do we need to do uh, after this? So we have understood what a direct method is. We have understood what an iterative method is. And we need to now learn a little bit about what, what I call spectral representation of solutions. Okay? And so we need to know what eigenvalues are, eigenvectors are, and how do we construct the solution in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I'm sh sure all of you have seen that, right? What is an eigenvalue problem? Given a matrix A is equal to B, for example, or given a, just a matrix A, what is the eigenvalue problem? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what is an eigenvalue problem? What is an eigenvalue and an eigenvalue? So we can look at this problem as a as an operator, and you operate this on a vector, it produces a new vector in general. Okay? So the matrix multiplication is nothing but a rule that defines what the product is. So x is a vector, and you multiply it, and you get a new vector. So in solving a system of linear equation, our problem is I know that operator, I know that b. So I want to find that vector x, which will when multiplied, will project that into b. But in an eigenvalue problem, what we have is we have A, uh, all this as uh, x to tilde is equal to lambda x tilde. Okay, that's called an eigenvalue problem. So what, what does this mean geometrically? It simply means that there are some special vectors, x, when you multiply that by A, it gives you the same vector, except for some stretching. The length of the vector might be different. And that length is given by this eigenvalue. But these two vectors are pointing in the same direction. Okay. So I can, uh, if I define like this, then the question is, how do I find such vectors? And how do I find the corresponding eigenvalue? The next question is, how do I represent the solution of this in terms of that eigenvectors? And that is a very important concept because we're going to generalize this from vector spaces to function spaces. That means instead of A as being a matrix, you will have B, some differential operator, operating on some function. Okay? And that is equal to F, some forcing term. Okay? So the problem of solving differential equation can be thought of in a very similar way. The problem is simply, I know what the differential operator is. I know what the forcing function is. I need to find this function U that satisfies the differential equation. Okay? Just like I need to find this vector that satisfies this algebraic equation. There is a beautiful book by Ramakrishna and uh, I think Amundsen 
uh, linear operator methods in chemical engineering. So that takes this unified approach of linear algebra and linear differential equations. All this will go out the window when I have a nonlinear differential equation. Okay, where n is a nonlinear operator, nonlinear de derivative operator. Same thing applies to the algebraic equation when we have a nonlinear algebraic equation. This course is about that, but we want to understand how the linear methods work before we can extend them computationally to the nonlinear systems. Okay, so if you go back to this problem of finding those eigenvalues and eigenvectors, that simply means I'm going to write it as A minus lambda times I. Okay, so I'm taking the right-hand side to the left-hand side, so I'm putting an identity matrix and multiply that by X hat is equal to zero. Okay, so when would I get a non-trivial solution to this problem? One, one way of satisfying this, x hat is zero. That equation will be satisfied. Okay, but I, I don't want the zero eigenvector. I want eigenvectors that are non-trivial. Okay, so if this has to be not zero, that means this has to be zero. Okay, so that means I'm going to set the determinant of a. Sorry. A minus lambda i as equal to zero. Okay. So we will see some of the efficient ways of solving. So this will give rise to when you when you take the determinant, it's going to be a scalar equation, but it will have lambda as the unknown. Okay, and a is a matrix that is given. All these numbers are given. So you will get something called a characteristic polynomial. And that characteristic polynomial has to be solved. So if you have three by three system, you'll have three eigenvalues. And each one of the eigenvalues you can take and put it in there and find then the corresponding eigenvectors. Okay? Now if A turns out to be symmetric, then these eigenvectors are said to be orthogonal, perpendicular to each other. So we will see what that means and uh, uh, if there what what happens if A is not symmetric, then you can find something called the left and the right. <coughs> And they are bi orthogonal. So we will build these ideas and then eventually see how to represent the solution to this in terms of that is called a spectrum. The eigenvalue is the spectrum, and we want to represent that solution in terms of the uh, eigenvectors. <coughs> and it's an important idea. We will never solve a linear system <coughs> by that. But by getting this concept, we can easily extend that to differential equations. So we will propose set of basis functions. We can use eigenvectors as basis to construct the real vector. So we can take a set of basis functions and construct the real function as a linear combination of them. So this idea of linear dependence, independence, etc. I think we will review. So we will probably stop there for the moment and pick up from here on Wednesday. Okay, so let's see how these guys are doing. Any questions for you guys? We're almost at the end. Does this time work well for you? So we'll see you on Wednesday.